New York is a place where people come to have their dreams realized. And I think that's why so many people not only come to the city, but ultimately make their way to Tiffany. Do I know how to give good fucking bites or what, people? <laughs> But just roll away and I'll babble on. Tell me when it's boring. Well, you know, I mean, a company like Tiffany, which is very old, you know, there's a lot of context to it. I'm not uninterested in it. Do you think we should celebrate brands, though? No. I called up my manager and I said, I have to pay my jewelry bill. I said, any movie that comes down the pike, any horrible piece of crap. So I did this horrible movie. There are a few American retail outlets that are true institutions. Bergdorf, Tiffany's. 7-Eleven. I'm wearing lots of Tiffany today. Are you? I'm wearing this, Jackie Oka. And my zipper necklace. Fuck, yes! I want something that I feel amazing in, like the look we're trying to create for this particular event. Event. <laughs> that blue box with a white ribbon is unequivocal. If you see that box under the Christmas tree, if you see that box on a birthday, you know you're getting something really, really special. And that is not an accident. That is a lot of very, very clever people spending a lot of time and energy thinking about this brand positioning, where they're going to sit in relation to their competitors and exactly where they want to be. It's our most recognisable brand quality and therefore it has to be perfect and it has to be right and people have a big um, affinity with that colour. I think it's such a recognisable brand colour that of course people have very positive associations with it. You know what, I'm just going to take it all away because that way you'll just really learn the lesson, okay? <laughs> Alrighty. Well, I'm going to run a couple of errands and I will see you at dinner. Oh. She took all my stuff. Yeah, everything but the little blue one. <gasps> That's the best one! Oh my god, thank you so much! I would love to have many of those little blue boxes, so yes, as a woman, I definitely understand the addiction to those little blue boxes. It happens to be such a beautiful color. The Tiffany blue is what you would call a, a robin's egg blue. It's a sophisticated color, but it has some green undertone. Obviously, working for Tiffany, we use it day in, day out. We apply it in so many different ways, and I think we really try to get that right. It's a very difficult color to mix. It's a very difficult color from a production standpoint to get right. It changes depending upon whether it's a painted surface, a printed fabric surface, a sprayed finish. 
The number of Tiffany Blue was 1837, and that was specifically uh, requested by Tiffany as the time when Tiffany first started. The Tiffany Blue formula is a closely guarded secret that Pantone has developed specifically for Tiffany, and that's something that is only sent out by Tiffany to their privileged partners. People are trademarking dumb stuff these days, but an institution like Tiffany's deserves to own that color blue. They made that blue. That blue was nothing until Tiffany's came along. When Tiffany wanted to create this image and consistency with all their packaging and media, we knew that we had to infuse that color with some of the same strong pigments and consistent pigments into that color to allow consistency, otherwise it'll fade. Color is synonymous with a brand, so we're seeing this more and more. Even celebrities today are branding themselves with, uh, we produced a color for Jay-Z, he has his own signature blue, but Kanye West had come to us, and I don't know, we got, we got into the rap world. That shit cracked. <laughs> that shit that shit crack. I'm not talking about rich, I'm talking about wealth, okay? I'm talking about the white family that owns all the fucking Similac. Those rich motherfuckers, okay? I'm talking about the white family that owns the color blue. Those rich bastards, okay? No choice of color has ever been so successful in the history of marketing. In 1853, the Empress Eugenie was the greatest fashion icon of her period. She was our kind of 19th century Grace Kelly. And as Empress of France, she chose an official color, this robin's egg pale turquoise blue as her official color, since whatever the Empress Eugenie did was going to be a worldwide success and followed by everybody, and that blue was going to become the world's number one color. Mr. Tiffany brilliantly jumped on the opportunity and immediately made it Tiffany's official color. Tiffany Blue is such a well-known color. I actually got the Pantone swatches and had a fabric match to it. I kept trying to say, I want this blue, I want this light blue, it's all about a light blue, and they kept coming back with like a robin's egg. And I kept saying, no, 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 Tiffany Blue, Tiffany Blue, and then I finally had to go and, and we dip dyed um, fabric in a dress to match, and you'll be seeing it on the red carpet very soon. <laughs> Get it! Hey! That's amazing! Give it to me. <laughs> with, the, with the bathing suit tan. It's I hilarious. mean, you have to just like, you, you just have, have to, to just like, go, just go yes. like, and yeah. own it and be yes. like, yep, off I go. Jeans are the, jeans are the rubber band around there. Look at my watch. Do you have a whoopsie? <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, but it's it is intense because it's not it's not to be taken lightly. You know, you right. presenting yourself in in a particular way because right. it's my business. Right. But you know, I was nineteen. Not wearing so high before, heel flip flops anymore. Right. No more right. high heel flip flops and tan lines <laughs> right. and crop tops. Right. I didn't know any better. <laughs> Most people don't. <laughs> there is no event in the whole world as important as the Oscars in terms of celebrity product placement. Everyone sees it. And, and when I do magazines or, or advertising, my mom sees it and my friends see it, my peers see it. But I don't think it has this sort of like broad reach. The jewelry on the red carpet is a very complicated game. I think it's big because it's so competitive, it's so valuable for brands. It's different with everybody. I mean, I have a handful of jewelers that I work with for red carpet dressing, and I've had relationships with them for a very long time. I've had a relationship with Tiffany for many, many years. I've had tremendous success with them. Jewelry, there's a tremendous amount of payola. Tremendous amount. It is not unusual for jewelers to be courting the talent with checks. The stakes are high and the payoff is great. The brands want that positioning and the actresses also want that exclusivity of being the only girl in the best dress, the only girl with the best necklace. Look how beautiful Oh my God, it's so gorgeous. Yeah, Thank have you. a look. Pass the mirror and look at that. Look that's at really that, fabulous. Yeah. You see? Yes, I can. It is so What do you think? How does it feel crazy. on? It I mean, it feels amazing, perfect. doesn't it? Yeah. And just the way it sits and the way it moves. It's, it's gorgeous. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. 
what's great about the Oscars is all of a sudden these exciting pieces that you've never seen before, you know, magically appear because I think they, <laughs> everyone keeps like a little, their little special stash for, for that time of year. <laughs> gorgeous. Isn't it's it? So isn't it? So isn't it? I mean, how gorgeous beautiful. is that? It's, what kind of stone is that? That's an aquamarine. So beautiful. So it's a gorgeous My aqua. Stone. Is, is it? Really? Oh. See? That's a gorgeous See? bird. I knew. It's meant to be. I was kindred spirits with you this too. You could feel it. It was calling you. God. I love this. So Jessica's amazing. She has that mixture of, of glamour, which can go back to another time, but she's also very contemporary. This is where I sort of put all my designs up and this is sort of gives a good idea of the overall feeling of where we're going as a design team and this is the initial drawing for your necklace that you have on, mm -hmm. it's already yours. <laughs> We've been looking at doing these fabulous earrings, drop earrings and a bracelet with tassels Gorgeous. that again will have that uh, fluid feeling. We did a lot of wreaths in the past but the beauty about this piece is that they're pear shaped diamonds going in one direction. Right. It's having a presence, and it's having a presence on somebody, you know, as gorgeous as her. I mean, especially around Blue Book, especially when people will come to Blue Book and they will see some of the pieces that she wore at the Oscars. It adds an enormous amount of value. I wonder, wonder who, 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 who wrote the book of The blue book is an upper. You know, when it comes in the mail, no one's allowed to throw it away. You can just look at it and you can dream with it. A lot of people just collect Tiffany, you know, and, and look forward to Blue Book all year. Blue Book is about stones. It's about how finding the most phenomenal stones. Some of the pieces are just going to be so stunning and so seductive. I'm hoping that I will fall in love with one of them and so will, you know, one of the wealthiest people in the world. Here's to the ladies who lunch. Everybody laugh. Lounging in their caftans and planning a brunch. Now, being a mother of twin eight-year-olds, I rarely have time for the cathartic retail experience. But they do know about Tiffany's, and those wonderful blue books that arrive at the house, and they see mommy looking at the jewelry, and I show them the jewelry. And in fact, this past Valentine's Day, one of my twin daughters came up to me and said, Mommy, what do you want from Tiffany's for Valentine's Day? I'll tell Daddy, and, and it was very cute. She told him I wanted the love ring. Only my husband ended up buying the Elsa Peretti love ring, and I was actually talking about the Paloma Picasso love ring ring and so I was very fortunate at the end I got both rings because both of my daughters wanted to be represented in this this Valentine's moment. We well, had a sense of fantasy and luxury and imagination. I have a, a pin of the um, of little bird standing on sitting on a stone which I love. Every, every time I wear it people go oh my goodness that's amazing but it's it's, 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 it's a remarkable piece. I'm wearing this ring now that had been my grandmother's that I think is from it's Paloma Picasso when she first started, I think from mid-70s. It's two stones, it's a, um, an amethyst, and I think it's an aquamarine, but it might be a blue topaz. Uh, my grandmother gave it to me. She often would, you know, give you a piece here or there, and this she gave me. Ah. Oh. Oh. oh no. What oh happened? My daughter. Are you wearing anything, Tiffany? Uh, no, I'm not. No. She has, though. Yeah, she's next in line for everything. <laughs> Either Serena or Fluffy, and I don't think Fluffy wants it, so. <laughs> oh, he can come in. That's all right, he can come in. Come in, come in. Oh, big baby. So Francesca's blue book theme is water. 
Did you know that? I did hear, yeah. You did hear that? I did hear that, yeah. She can be quite secretive, Francesca. She definitely can, because I haven't seen a thing. <laughs> it's more that she's, I think, focused on something and maybe, you know, not ready to sort of pull it out and bear it just yet for me to go, Ugh, or me to go, wow, or me to go, what the fuck are you doing? Or, you know, or any of those things. But I do remember sort of hearing whispers that sh there were possibilities that she was gonna get this job at Tiffany. And uh, it was one of those ones where suddenly it just felt all the stars had aligned in the right place and Francesca was right in the epicenter and it felt right. It felt like she, had earned it because she has been doing this for a long time. You know, I think there's two things that help me. One, I'm a woman. It's surprisingly the first design director for Tiffany that's a woman. And that's kind of great because, you know, I try the jewelry on and I wear it and I feel it. I have to, I mean, I want to. If I don't wear it, I can't make decisions on it. This is something that needs to sit on the body. I have to wear it. And then secondly is the fact that I'm, I'm a trained jeweler. So I'm going to think about the construction. It's just ridiculously perfect that she looks like Audrey Hepburn and she's designing for Tiffany. <laughs>
There are only two women in the world that have worn her. Uh, in 1961, Walter Hoving, being the entrepreneur and the publicist that he was, uh, decided to have some film shots taken here at the store. And Miss Hepburn wore the necklace, uh, wore the diamond in a necklace designed by Schlumberger. In order for the production to get access to Tiffany's, they granted Tiffany's a little photo shoot with Audrey wearing the Tiffany diamond necklace. So they did a little bit of a trade. Paramount got the store and the company got Audrey. So she was the second woman. The first woman uh, was a socialite in 1957. Tiffany and Company was co-hosting a charity ball up in Newport, Rhode Island. And the co-hostess, Mrs. Sheldon Whitehouse, was actually the very first woman to ever wear her. He found the diamond, the rough, in the Kimberley mine in uh, South Africa. It was 287 carats, huge rough. And he had the opportunity to buy it. Of course, enormous risk to buy something like this. One is never quite sure with that size of rough truly what you're going to get out of it. When you're cutting a rough to a smaller diamond, often many of the pieces you're cutting away are so included that they're not really usable. Maybe some of the smaller pieces were, but predominantly that is all weight loss. So he took the risk. He had a sense that there was something within that that was special. So he bought the, the rough. The rough was sent over to Europe and the first cut was made, but there came out the most incredibly brilliant, and beautiful diamond with 82 facets, quite unique at that time. Diamonds were not cut with that many facets. The wonderful thing is you look at that Tiffany diamond now, and it looks as modern as if it were cut last week or a month ago or a year ago. It's incredibly advanced. So that's very special. This is a very special diamond. The security of her is extremely tight, obviously. But during my time on the main floor, we had a, a procedure that uh, after the store closed and the stainless steel doors uh, were locked, she was withdrawn from the vault on the main floor. You had to wear the white gloves and she was put in her carriage and whisked away for the night. There is a little secret. Uh, one night when I was removing her from the case, for just a moment, I, I thought about Miss Hepper and I thought about Mrs. Whitehouse. They had both worn it in a necklace, and I thought, a tiara. I could be the first person, the first woman, the first employee that wore her as a tiara. So for a second, I put her in my coif, and I stood there, and I was actually transformed. Life is not measured by the number of beats that, that your heart makes. Life is truly measured by the moments that take our breath away. And that moment, I will never forget. It truly did? Uh, it did. I was breathless. There's something amazing about the fact that the film begins with the windows. The windows are the first opportunity to spread the Tiffany magic, and that's why the film begins that way. You know, she gets out of the car, she looks at the window, and she's instantly transported. In window one, she was looking at these tall uh, wooden structures are kind of like multifaceted wooden pieces with beautiful Schlumberger bracelets on them. In window two, it's miniature chandeliers suspended beautifully with brooches suspended within them. They're tremendously beautiful windows and those were very iconic Jean Moore displays. Perhaps that was the first time that people saw on a global scale Jean Moore's work. <laughs> Thank you. 
It's fun. It's all part of the, the whole thing. It's fun to do. I love doing it, even uh, after all these years. <laughs> Gene was really a pioneer in modern window display because in the past, the idea was cram as much as you could into the window and have all the price tags on it and it's all about pushing the merchandise. But Gene distilled it. He would show one or two pieces, but it was the way you got in was you wanted to see what he was going to do with the windows. People have forgotten a new generation doesn't really know. I don't think that they know the whole story. I've been known to break a glass in the window. And that was fun because people would call up and say, you know you have a broken glass in the window? I say, yes, I know. There's a hammer right beside it that broke it. I learned to do things different, uh, to make a difference, because uh, I wanted to see how much attention people paid to it. And they would call up and say, do you know you have one knife turned backwards, a one key turned backwards? I said, yeah. And then I knew that people looked at it. It's the only way I could check up. Gene Moore had a wonderful sense of wit in place. He understood the whole theater of window design. He took it to a place that would use uh, incongruous objects with beautiful jewelry. walk around the floor with Gene, you know, selecting product for the window. He used to love to use eggs, you know, he used to blow out eggs and use eggs in a different way. Eggs, to me, is the most perfect shape in the whole world. I like them the way they come right out of the hen. I don't believe in painted eggs. Eggs are not to be painted. They're so beautiful in themselves that I leave them the way they are. It was always sort of juxtaposed jewelry and something unique. He just did whatever he wanted. The labor that went into creating those things and the artists he engaged, because he did engage people to work with him. And they were on his Rolodex. They were not on anyone else's Rolodex. You would never, and they were very true to him. One of his most spectacular windows was a giant white spear hanging over a strand of pearls. And I put them in and I thought, Something is wrong. You know, it's, it's too clean, it's wrong. So I broke the string of pearls. I thought, I'll catch hell, but I broke the string of pearls, and I had the pearls, you know, and it helped the window. It made the window, as a matter of fact. And only Gene would have been able to get away with showing damaged goods in the windows at Tiffany's. They're the teasing glimpse into a world that you want to be part of. It was very humbling to be thinking I'm part of something that's ended up in a window at Tiffany's on Fifth Avenue. I mean, it's a privilege and a joy. Imagine a house of Tiffany's saying, hey, go and make anything you want and work with these extraordinary crafts people upstairs who literally still hand make the items. Is that you, my lovely? Daisy Buchanan, the golden girl. A breathless warmth flowed from her, a promise that there was no one else in the world she so wanted to see. Do they miss me in Chicago? Uh, yes, um, um, at least a dozen people send their love. How gorgeous. I've just been in China. I've just released The Great Gatsby in China. Yes, they're dazzled by all the luxury, but they're also very aware of the heart issue of the book. And that is this paradox between this roaring 20s, where there's such an orgy of money, to quote Fitzgerald, and then there's this kind of devastation in the American dream, if you like. There must be a center and there must be meaning. In the last 10 years, the people have just experienced a tremendous change, not just in their lifestyle, but in the, in the way 
they feel about themselves. A lot of Chinese were starting to get wealthy, and they saw that with that wealth, they should treat themselves a little bit better. And they've got to this point now where finally they can live a, a beautiful life and they can start thinking about what they really want and not just what they need. This idea of the American dream. And, and when you think American dream, Chinese dream, and the vision that they both speak to, you realize that all the values that they're selling are universal. I don't even want to own anything until I can find a place where new things go together. I'm not sure where that is, but I know what it's like. It's like Tiffany's. Tiffany's? You mean the jewelry store? That's right. I'm crazy about Tiffany's. Although Tiffany, in its, its current incarnation, is not a celebrity-driven brand, the one celebrity who is beyond reproach, who is enduringly popular, who will always be associated with the brand, is Audrey Hepburn. I was definitely familiarized with, with the whole notion of, of Tiffany's through the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's. For me, when I was younger, seeing that movie, seeing her and seeing the name Tiffany's, embodied everything that was glamorous and slightly unattainable about New York. Well, no, because of the title. Great product placement without needing, without meaning it. <laughs> Tiffany got lucky, sort of in the same way that Campbell's Soup got lucky with Andy Warhol. It just happened that this film was made. It was not made for any kind of advertorial purpose. It's perfect. It's a perfect image. A lot of people confuse me with Audrey Hepburn. Um, <laughs> I mean, there are good things about it, there are horrible things about it. What's horrible? Mickey Rooney. <laughs> Mickey Rooney, breakfast at Tiffany's? Where's his Oscar? Come on. In 30 seconds, I got to call the police. That's grotesque. And of course, it was never actually okay. It was just allowed. You know, all kinds of things are allowed doesn't mean they're okay. I genuinely admire the movie. I admire the risks that were taken by Audrey Hepburn, by Blake Edwards, Mancini, and um, Givenchy. You want a character you're gonna love. Well, at the time, I, I, I thought it was a, a very interesting choice. I mean, she had style, she had class, she had a quality, I think, that, that worked. I don't think people know that she was sort of like a, uh, a prostitute, high-end kind of prostitute in New York City trying to claw her way up to the top. I think when the, now they see it, she looks like a socialite. They think she is a socialite. Won't you join me? Yes, join Audrey Hepburn as you've never seen her before, kicking over the traces and bringing to life Truman Capote's Breakfast at Tiffany's. Well, the first time I saw Breakfast at Tiffany's, it didn't, didn't cross my mind that she was a prostitute. Capoli doesn't come right out and say it, but if you read between the lines, it's something that he wanted you to consider. My mom told me afterwards, and I was like, what? Really? What'd she say? She's like, by the way. Yeah, she's like, you know that she's a, a call girl. And I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> what, what gave you that sense? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in retrospect, I'm like, okay, it's, it's a bit obvious once you have that in your mind. You She's a hooker? Are you surprised they make a doll out of a hooker? Why do they do that? But seriously, is she a hooker? Yeah. Then why is she just like that, going to Tiffany's for breakfast? Think about what you're seeing on screen. The sun is coming up. A beautiful girl in evening dress is getting out of a cab. Why? What is she doing in an evening dress at that hour? Is she going out to a party at sunrise? Probably not. More likely, she's coming home from a party at sunrise. Not and, then the next, for and the next morning. Oh, so she, oh. So she hooked up with a rich guy and she wants no, that guy to not, get her well, something. Well, not exactly. So what's up with her outfit? How is she? She keeping... wants extra cash on the side, so she's always like hooking up with men, right? Well, yeah, they, I mean, she was a gal who did take money for entertaining guys. It didn't, it didn't specifically say it became a sexual situation or not, but uh, I don't think in the film you look her as an out and out hooker. She's got too many other elements. You love her kookiness. 
kook was one of the words. It was kind of a code word. It was a, it was a euphemism to um, comfort nervous audiences who knew a little bit about what Capote's novel was about and get them to feel sort of more comfortable with the idea that they were seeing a friendly movie, a safe movie. It may not have been Capote's original concept, and I guess that was a studio decision for what they wanted uh, Hollywood Lightly to be like. Marilyn is closer to the Holly Go Lightly in the novel. So on a certain level, it makes sense that Truman would want her. Man, you guys you guys are lucky that we just woke up. We're like we're That's really good. we're really raw. Yeah, we're um, really raw. Can we can we talk about the song Breakfast at Tiffany's? Sure, go ahead. But we were out in Montauk a couple years ago. We were DJing our friend's wedding, and we found ourselves on the beach trying to start a bonfire. And uh, before we knew it, we were joined by a bunch of Ukrainian or... Eastern, Eastern European, Eastern, Ukrainian. Yeah, like really good looking Eastern European teenagers. Because that's who works in Montauk And for the suddenly summer. one of them, the young boy, breaks out a guitar yeah. and starts singing acoustically breakfast at Tiffany's with a heavy Ukrainian accent and, this, yeah, this, and a slow jam. It was amazing. And this very broken sort of English, um, which made it kind of better somehow. He's singing, he's singing it, and everyone's singing along. And I'm looking at them, and I'm like, you guys are 16 and 17 and 18. First of all, you're way too young to know this song. Also, they're Ukrainian. Yeah, like how did you? They what? were communist a few years ago. What? And now they're singing a capitalist song about breakfast at Tiffany's. I thought if I could get that phrase, Breakfast at Tiffany's, into a song, that people might like it. It sounds great, but you can't just say, Breakfast at Tiffany's is Breakfast at Tiffany's, you know. It's a weird song. And I said, what about Breakfast at Tiffany's? She said, I think I remember the film. And as I recall, I think we both kind of like it, liked it. Well then, I guess that's the one thing we've got. This is Almost nothing poetic about it. <laughs> it's just it's the inflections. Yeah. 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 You'll say. I have had people who I went out with swear up and down, oh no, this is about me because we watched that movie. I'm like, no, we didn't. And so all these people think that it's somehow about them, and it's completely fabricated. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Tiffany's. The size of the diamond or the quality of the diamond? The quality. Scarlet. Maybe the size. No, I think the size, I mean, what if it's like a really ugly diamond and it's like so big that you just can't stand it? Then you would turn it. From that moment on, Charlotte would tell everyone that right in front of Tiffany's, out of nowhere, Trey popped the question, and she said, all righty. The engagement ring, as we know it, was introduced by Tiffany himself. Charles Tiffany created a ring that was 
more brilliant than all others. It was a beautiful ring where the stone was lifted up off the band and held up so that the light could uh, scintillate. This is the one you see in cartoons. I got a surprise for Betty. Get a load of this. Wow! <laughs> what a sparkler! I remember when we first got engaged walking in there and being so shocked at the prices. <laughs> I said, we, we got to look somewhere else. Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I was 20, 24, 25 years old at the time, and I couldn't quite afford Tiffany, so. Really? You're a Mara. <laughs> I, yeah, but I was a struggling young lawyer at the time. I, I, th I think it was someplace on 47th Street 47th? Uh, at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> The whole engagement thing at Tiffany's is just a story in itself. What do you mean? It's a mystery. I just see people there and kids and grown-ups. Like, does anyone ever bought an engagement ring there? <laughs> no, actually, today we have a lot of self-purchasers. And so the larger, the purer, the rarer, the better. They all want Picassos, but on their fingers. Um, here I have, I only have one, actually I have about two and a half million dollars right here, 2.5 million. It allows you to get a ring for her for every occasion. So one for every day. This actually is very reasonable, it's $306,000. One for dinner. This is a Tiffany uh, Lucida. This is a five carat, it's a Dean Turney Flawless and one for the gala. Uh, this also is five carats. The Tiffany setting the five carats, a DVVS one, and this $923,000. Still a bargain, just sub one million. By the way, we do accept cash. I think that most people there all aspire to have that, and then the girls try it on, but I would think it's disappointing, because then I don't know if they actually buy it, and then they will have to walk down 15 blocks mm -hmm. to go get a copy of the <laughs> ring. It always goes like this. Oh, I, my cousin knows someone on 47th Street. <laughs> did you get a blue box when you got engaged? I didn't. You didn't? No. And I asked why not. <laughs> but you know, this At is... At that moment? Listen. Before we even answered. No. Like, no, I didn't. I didn't. But, but we were very young, and he was a waiter, and... <laughs> You know, I don't think blue boxes really came a lot very often <laughs> at that time. I was like 22. If we ever did get married, which we don't believe in marriage, it's a great institution. <laughs> yeah, but who wants to be part of an institution? Tiffany. Is that right? <laughs> oh, really? Right here. Mm -hmm. well, then let me ask My you wedding this. ring. Mm -hmm. So then, obviously, you know that they put out this gay ad, right? No. The famed Tiffany & Company thinking outside of the little blue box tonight. Check out this new ad for engagement rings featuring a real-life gay couple. It's going viral tonight. Tiffany says, quote, it's part of a modern approach to love and romance. Oh, how great. Now, why is that great? Well, because it's about time. A spokesman for Tiffany said that everyone, whether they are gay or straight, should have the right to grossly overpay for jewelry. <laughs> That's right, we all have. Well, yeah, but they're also supporting their bottom line. They realize there is this whole new category of people who can get married. They want to see those people wearing Tiffany rings. Because whenever you get a Tiffany ring, you like know it's from Tiffany. How do you know? I mean, because first of all, the style and the color of the box. But even if you didn't have the box, just something in the diamond, they're like really white, they're really beautiful. I think that if you get it from like, um, other jewelry brands, see, like, I don't know that many because I know Tiffany, that's it. And the more he spends, what does that mean? The more he loves you. Is or the true? more he's rich. Do you believe that? Well, the more he the spends. The more he wants to win you over. The more, more he wants to win, win you over. Yes. So I was first introduced to Tiffany and Company when I was in the eighth grade. My Nana took me to pick out my first piece of Tiffany's, and from there on, I became obsessed. Uh, then I met my now husband, and he proposed to me at the Tiffany and Company in Boston. So we were watching Sweet Home Alabama one night when we first started dating, and I just offhanded comment said, that would be the most magical, amazing proposal, and he somehow remembered. And so from there, I decided to follow the theme, and we did a Tiffany & Company themed wedding. I did a Tiffany & Company themed bridal shower, a bachelorette party. I'm pretty sure when I have children, I'll probably do a Tiffany & Company themed baby shower. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
<laughs> People are gonna think I'm crazy. They're gonna like take me to Tiffany rehab after this. <laughs> when I first wrote Sweet Home Alabama, I wrote a normal scene where a guy just uh, proposed to his girlfriend and I think it was a very private moment. So wrote the movie, turned it into studio. The studio said, we love the script, but we think you could do better with the proposal. Can we come up with something just a little more dazzling? Because the Patrick uh, Dempsey character was supposed to be this kind of really cool guy. And he was the, you know, the most eligible bachelor, uh, dating Reese Witherspoon's character. So I went home that night and my wife said, so how, how did it go at the studio? And I said, well, it's all really good, but they now want me to come up with the best you know, proposal that's ever been on film. So we started throwing ideas around at the dinner table and she said, well, you know, I was proposed to once at Tiffany's. And I was like, wait, what? And so I found out that night that my wife had been proposed to about five times. And um, so I was like, huh. So I said, well, what, so what happened? You mean he walked you? And then she said, well, he walked me into Tiffany's and he said, pick one. And I was like, why didn't you say yes? Andrew, are you on some sort of medication? What's going on? Where are we? Oh my God. Oh my God. I think the scene in Tiffany's is one of my most recognized scenes. I mean, that's why my wall is uh, Tiffany blue. I mean, I literally, when I was moving into this office and my, you know, the guy was uh, decorating it, I just said, there's gotta be some sort of Tiffany color in here. Has to be a tip of a hat to a very successful movie and a very successful scene. Yes. <laughs> Yes! Yes! Pick one. I actually went to Bora Bora with my wife, sort of a second honeymoon, and we ran in, you know, we ran into honeymooners. And as we started talking and getting to know them, they found out I was a film director. And when I said Sweet Home Alabama, they were like, oh my God, Tiffany's. Well, I needed to use jewelry in the Oceans trilogy. And I had a dress some of the most beautiful women in the world with some of the handsomest men in the world. So I figured I'd better go to the most important jewelry company in the world. When a person puts on a great piece of jewelry, and the Tiffany jewelry. They feel a certain way. It gives them a certain joie de vie that they don't, might not have without that. I mean, Julia has it either way, but it, it makes her feel good. It makes her feel like she has something important on, which she does. With movie stars like Julia Roberts and so on and so forth, I, I don't say, wear this and wear it now. I sit down with them and I say, this is jewelry from Tiffany's. Take a look at it and see what catches your eye, see what you enjoy. And then they find things that they like and they try them on and they try them on with the dress they're wearing and they try them on again and again and again and they change their mind four or five times. So, <laughs> and then they finally settle in on a, on a piece. You are up to something, Danny, what? And don't say you came here for me. You're pulling a job, aren't you? Well, know this, no matter what it is, you won't win me back. Tess, I just came to say goodbye. I got you something, and um, oh, it's a Tiffany. Buck. Thank you. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't invited to the wedding. Hmm? Yeah, and I'm, no. Yeah, we don't know each other. Not. not I don't know to, you. For you to come to the wedding. I don't no. know. I just met you tonight. It yeah, would have been really odd. Actually. And so I don't think. I know I don't know you, but I just wanted to give you something. Okay. And so well, I'll thank you. you. And you can share that with your wife. Uh, well, can I open it now? Yeah, go ahead, please, please, too. Is it? Uh, yeah. Wow, it's. Uh, yeah. Wow, it's just, it, 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 it is it's really a Tiffany thing. Oh, come on. I'm on network now, man. Of course it's going to be <laughs> Tiffany. This isn't Comedy yeah. Central yeah, swag. Gotcha. It's wow. engraved. It's engraved. What does it say? It says, I don't know you. <laughs> in this new year, someone will fall in love. Someone will have a cake with candles. Someone will move away. Someone will come home. Someone will finally graduate. Someone will be born. 
someone will propose to someone, what we're doing when we do this is to explain Tiffany's purpose in the world to maybe a younger generation that is not familiar with it. It's a little lost on my generation because I think it's a bit tired and there's a lot of psychological components to Tiffany's. We touch on the products we sell like engagement rings and gifts for special occasions. But there's no direct selling here. It's just an attitude. It's a feeling about our customer and who we are. I think it is a little bit of a brainwash. A lot of the ads are white families. It's, it's a little bit of a 1950s kind of feel to it. We want to speak to our customer as a human being, as someone who has a family, maybe you have children, maybe you wants to get married. It stretches true love so much. It's such an unrealistic true love, which also, I think, gives us a little bit of a ugh. I was about 11 years old, and I saw the ad in the New York Times, where Tiffany's ads have always been. I saw an ad for a ring, and the ring was cost $176,000. I remember thinking that was just an inconceivable amount of money. I was the son of two writers. We were not rich by any stretch of the imagination, and that just seemed incredible. And so I wrote this letter, and on the one hand, it was, I could do the math, and so it was a slightly snarky letter, I suppose. But at the same time, I was 11 years old, I remember thinking, well, you never know. Dear Tiffany's. I saw your ad about the $176,000 ring. I would like to buy it for my mother, but my allowance is 50 cents a week. Can we work out some kind of arrangement? Sincerely, Sincerely David Jablonski. Dear David, I'm afraid that at 50 cents a week it would take you 352,000 weeks to pay up, and I'm not sure that either you or I will be around at that time, at least not in our present form. However, I am sending you some gold earrings for your mother. If she likes the earrings, we will settle with you for one week's allowance. A happy new year to you and your mother. Kindest regards, Walter Hoving. Well, there is one man who agrees with that. His name is Walter Hoving, and he is the president, chief executive officer of Tiffany, a store of which you may have heard. And here is Don Brokaw. Thank you, Gene. Walter Hoving has been in retailing for 60 years now, and he has been affiliated with places as different as Montgomery Wards and Bonwood and & Teller and Lord and & Taylor, and for the past 23 years, he's been the chairman of Tiffany's. Last week, he placed an ad in a newspaper. It said, no, we are not open Sundays or at night, so we suggest you shop early in the day and avoid the crowds. Mr. Hoving, why aren't you open on Sundays? After all, this is the biggest time of the year, I would suspect, for Tiffany's. We think our customers need a rest, so we keep closed on Sunday. Mr. Hoving, you have uh, on sale at Tiffany's an emerald necklace that is worth $1,700,000, and you have a diamond that is worth $7 million, I think, That's altogether. Right. What if someone were passing through town and decided that they wanted to buy one of those two items, but they were only available on Sunday? Would you open in the store to sell them one of those two items? No, we would not, no. You'd pass on that sale? Just That's right. Walter Hoving, outspoken chairman of the board of a little store, as we like to say, on the corner here in New York, called Tiffany's. <laughs> when you pick it up? 
Uh, not really, no. But I, I remember being handed uh, the trophy and remember thinking, you know, please don't drop it. You're on national television. You've got millions of people watching. So I think I held it with two hands. But it's really not very heavy at all. But it is, it is beautiful. And uh, uh, we sure like the four that we have. And, and that's your goal. And uh, it's a tough goal to achieve because there are 31 other clubs out there trying to do the same thing. By the time the trophy is coming out, usually we're like divvying up, you know, our winnings or our losses and not paying a lot of attention to that Super Bowl trophy. But I bet the players are. And I bet when those players get that trophy and their wives or their girlfriends are standing just off the side, they say, I want my trophy. <laughs> Steinbrenner bought the Yankees in 1973. At that time, I think the Top Hat logo was more in use. It adorned every team publication. It was more commonly used. He was more attracted to the interlocking in wide. Thought it was something very classy about it. So almost immediately from the time he owned the team, that was the logo of choice. Tiffany had designed that interlocking NY on a police medal that was given in 1877 to a wounded New York City police officer. One of the Yankees' two owners in their first decade of existence was William Devery, who had been chief of police of New York City. William Devery probably kept that NY design in some form of uh, circulation and he was still half owner of the team in 1909 when it first appeared on the Yankee uniform. That made the Yankee hat more famous than the Yankee can. You should know I bleed blue, but I ain't a crypto. But I got a gang of walking with my click though. That you were living in. Long live the world trade. Long live the king, yo. I'm from the Empire State. That's Get another announcement in a second. Yeah, shoot, say it again. Was first Why was Tiffany chosen? Got it. Okay. Here in Grand Central Terminal, many people believe and testify that our magnificent October starlit zodiac ceiling, which happens to be made of Tiffany blue to represent the sky, that there may be a correlation. It's one we're perfectly willing to accept. It's all surrounded by the world's largest, most magnificent piece of Tiffany glass, the clock that just identifies this terminal. There's been a billion movies made about New York. Every possible building statue has been in a movie. This has never been in a movie. That's how I convinced Marty to do it. It's so beautiful, that clock, that from the back, that clock is beautiful. And people, you know, don't really see the clock that I came out of because you can only see it if you are going up Park Avenue. Our Tiffany clock, all the original parts are still there, the original motors, the original gears. With all these pieces, 100 years old, it's accurate to within one second every 1,400,000 years.
Well, I can say that I was thrilled to read the biography of Steve Jobs because I had not realized that Steve Jobs had appreciated the design and the work of Louis Tiffany. One of the illustrations in that book, it depicted Steve Jobs sitting on the floor in a virtually empty room in his home where the only object was a floor lamp. What the book went on to say is that he couldn't furnish his home because he couldn't find anything that met his standards of design, and there you have a Tiffany lamp. Well, he appreciated the beauty in it and the clean and what he was trying to say. Well, Tiffany was about beauty, and, and he was too. It was about design and perfect design. When you think of the magnolia, you hearken back to nature, and then even if you go further, you think of Japanese culture, because Tiffany traveled tremendously throughout the, the world, and he brought many of his influences from traveling into his design aesthetic. So it, it can, you can relate to it in very different ways. One of his quotes was, nature is always beautiful. I think that was very inspirational. Color was so important to him. He, was, he considered himself a colorist and it comes through in everything that was made. I've been feeling old, I've been feeling cold. You're the heat that I know. Listen, you are my son. By the time that Charles Louis Tiffany dies, Louis has really mastered all of these different forms. And I think that the jewelry really is such a continuation of his aesthetic, again, the emphasis on color, the emphasis on nature. Louis went on to do very much the same as his father did, which was to create a brand and to open this incredible luxury sort of retail emporium and very much followed in his father's footsteps. The sidewalks along Fifth Avenue are always crowded with shoppers. Fran and Sally did some shopping, too. They were just window shopping here, though. Yes, this is the Tiffany's, the world-famous jewelry store. Well, this was, of course, the summer of 1945, and we were looking for a summer job. We had been turned down by most of the department stores. And when we went up the avenue, suddenly, there, we saw Tiffany's. We loved to be on the main floor because we wanted to watch the door for all the celebrities. That was a dazzling moment to see Judy Garland. When she walked in with her new husband, she looked so happy. And to hear that famous laugh ring through the store, who knows what she was laughing about, but what she purchased as a gift from MGM or emeralds, which made me think of the Wizard of Oz. They said that was her wedding present. She could choose anything she wanted at Tiffany. People get ready. The robots are coming. This watch is incredible. This is um, quite amazing. This is from our archive. This is FDR's last watch. Now, we made a lot of watches for presidents, and it's surprisingly small, I have to say. When you wear it, it literally sends shivers down your spine. You can see here how much he loved it and how much he wore it, because all of the stitching on this side is completely worn off. We have this amazing history of watchmaking. I found it extremely inspiring. <laughs>
first blue box was around when I was 12 or 13, and I remember being rather disappointed on my 16th birthday when there were multiple blue boxes, and there was a large one, and I was really excited to open it up and see what was inside, and it was, of course, the first box that I went for, and when I started opening it up inside, I found an etiquette book. I think my first exposure was the Tiffany's etiquette book for teenagers. I came to the U.S. when I was eight or nine, so we weren't so well-schooled on American etiquette, and they were like, this is a good book to learn from, beyond chopsticks. So my first memory of Tiffany's is they have an etiquette guide for teenagers, Tiffany's Table Manners for Teenagers. I remember the Christmas, I was probably 13, maybe 14 at the time. An etiquette book isn't what every teenager wants for Christmas. I think it's such an iconic, respected American brand, so I think parents might think that it's a great thing to give to a young girl. So that was a little bit of a disappointment, um, but yes, a Tiffany etiquette book. But apparently, I guess, you know, I learned a few things from it. And it wasn't until I was older when I realized that if I'm gonna move to New York, if I'm gonna make it in the big city, I should know which one is the salad fork, which one is the soup spoon. And so I found myself sneakily, stealthily, like looking for that book and reading a few chapters. And I actually just bought it for my son, and he's nine, and we were at breakfast, and I gave it to him, and he looked at it, and he looked at me, he goes, my name is not Tiffany, and I'm not a teenager. Here you go, you can have it back. I was super lucky that um, for one of my birthdays, my team literally captured me, blindfolded me. They actually took me on this surprise trip. And when I opened my eyes, I was on the second floor of this Tiffany's. And they had created this wonderful breakfast for me. So I literally had breakfast at Tiffany's. At who, el who else had a birthday? <laughs> Uh, I think Katie Couric had her birthday there. Katie Couric? You know no, I don't, but I'm very happy to share that experience with Katie. Katie's a very jolly lady. They let Glenda Bailey have a party at Tiffany? I thought I was the only one. I was turning 50, and unlike a lot of people, I love birthdays, and I love parties. <laughs> an inside job, basically. My friend Carol uh, works at Tiffany. I was trying to find a really cool, fun, different space. We had a cocktail party on the first floor. We served Tiffaninis, which looked dangerously like um, Tidy Bowl, but they were delicious and strong. I think it will probably go down in history, my personal history, as my best birthday ever. When I die, bury me inside the church die. I am a Scorpio, just like Elsa Peretti. And Elsa Peretti, of course, designed this beautiful necklace, which was a present from my team. And um, it reminds everybody that uh, the qualities that Scorpio is supposed to have. And all I can tell you is that Elsa is one of the most passionate, strong, and uh, focused individuals I've ever had the pleasure to meet. On my wish list, of course, is the Scorpio. The dar, which is the vibe. My first piece I wanted was the bone calf from Elsa Peretti. Oh, everybody should have a Peretti sterling cuff. I mean, I had a client in here earlier today who collects Peretti, and she was wearing a pair of Peretti earrings, and it's just like, it's always good. When Elsa started at Tiffany, it was the mid 1970s, and Elsa Peretti was hot, you know? I mean, she was part of Halston's entourage. She was a model. She um, had been designing jewelry that was on the, the catwalks with Halston and uh, Giorgio de San Angelo, and the jewelry was a hit. I really liked the design of the Elsa Peretti pieces, so for my editorial work and also with fashion shows, I've used it a lot because it's some of my favorite jewelry that exists. Well, this is the first piece of jewelry that Elsa Pretty designed at Tiffany, one of the first pieces, but she really designed it before she started. And you know, there's a necklace that's like a bud vase that an orchid could fit in. She said she designed it because when she saw the girls in Capri wearing flowers in their hair, she thought that was the most beautiful thing in the world, but she didn't want her flower to die. So she made a bottle pendant to put the flower in and that's what it's for. But like, 
there's sort of a suggestion that you could also keep your drugs in there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, like, you know, it's cool. she was able to do in terms of communicating her language and her aesthetic through jewelry, she certainly paved the way for people like myself and other jewelry designers today. And there's not a lot of places that want to bring other designers in under their umbrella. Being a part of Vogue and being a part of the CFDA is wonderful because they really do foster new designers and help companies. You know, I can't even tell you what the last year has done for my business, just being a part of it. When I won Runner Up, I got a really nice gift from Tiffany and I was in heaven. The idea of jewelry and, and, and to succeed as a jewelry designer, I think is something that even clothing designers have aspiration for. The year Monique Pion won, she was a runner-up winner. She won $100,000, and uh, her choice of mentor. Went into Anna Winter's office, and she said, if you could have any mentor, who would you choose? And I said, you know, if I could have anyone, I, I would love to be able to work with. Michael Kowalski, the CEO of Tiffany. What intrigued me, of course, was her intense interest in the materials that she uses and her commitment to, to sustainability, not only in terms of materials, but in terms of, of the, the folks who provide those materials. And I thought it was a, a wonderful story, and I, I think it's relevant for luxury today. Rather than taking from the earth, finding things that you can reinvent, fossils are so incredible because they're almost like nature's photographs, um, and that they're able to tell a story through time. And I use a lot of fossilized woolly mammoth and fossilized dinosaur bone. This is fossilized woolly mammoth, the cream parts that have been trapped in the ice over tens of thousands of years. And then in the center is fossilized woolly mammoth, the root of the tooth, and the salt minerals over 35,000 years change the color to these deep blues. And then in the middle is fossilized dinosaur bone. That's from the Jurassic period and 150 million years old. In jewelry designing, talented new artists like Jean Schlumberger originate elaborate ideas which are the despair of manufacturers who serve the mass market. I love the, um, one of my favorites is the, sh I, I can never pronounce it, Schlum Schlumberger. 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 Mm -hmm. Yep, make him Jewish. Schlumberger. <laughs> <laughs> Schlumberger, oh no, my God, that's so embarrassing. You, you corrected her, right? I mean, you've got, you, you, I mean, of course, the, oh my God, when I'm blanking out Schlumberger's, uh, Schlumberger, I'm saying it wrong. What's the? And they brought out the brooch and they said, this is Schlumberger. Is that how it's pronounced? What's the? Schlumberger. Schlumberger. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the Schlumberger. <clears throat> These are heirlooms, they're family heirlooms, and they are from the 1940s. The early Schlumberger. I love the Schlumberger pieces. Whenever I go into the Tiffany store, that's where I go and just kind of pet the cabinets and, <laughs> and drool. <laughs> Schlumberger pieces that I bought. He really was uh, attracted to themes in nature. What he's most known for are the Schlumberger enamel bracelets. Jackie Kennedy used to wear them all the time, and those are fantastic. I'm really a fan of big, big, big pieces. This brooch I'm super, I'm really partial to. I used to read Elizabeth Taylor, My Love Affair with Jewelry. It was my very favorite piece in the book. And I thought I always wanted it. And then when this came up for auction, I think it went for about a million dollars. Yes. 550 then and selling. 550,000 at 6,300,000 then. Here we are. Sold for you, sir. 7,800,000 dollars. Thank you very much. 
I thought, well, I'm never going to get the Elizabeth Taylor one. And so I got this. And I think it was, don't quote me, like 60 or 70,000. But there's only six of these. This one was made in the 80s. designs that we have, we don't change. We try and recreate. Some designs were never made. Some sketches were only part sketched. And sometimes you have to guess. But it's all in what he left. There's nothing uh, that's being adapted or changed. Diamonds. Are a girl's best our friend. Our girl's best friend. And it went better night to sparkle than on Oscars. Thank goodness. Thank goodness for Tiffany and co. Look at this. Look how gorgeous. To die. And by the way, this was one her. of her favorite pieces. I know. We well, we brought York. that after she was. Uh, yeah, she went right to that and was really drawn to that. One. Yeah, she'll be very excited about that. So and we so am to I. We, which we, of course, are also partial to because it's so close to Tiffany blue color. Oh right, got it. Jessica Beal here on the red carpet. Hi, how are you? There you are. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. So tell me about your dress. Let's start with the E fashion. Okay. okay. Yes. This is Chanel Couture, mm -hmm. and I'm basically just decked head to toe in Tiffany's. You've got <laughs> arm candy, but not your other arm candy. He's out on tour. Isn't yes, he? yes, out on tour, busy working. I'm watching it on TV with PRs and other stylists. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. With other stylists. Yeah, I have a couple together. stylists I'm friends with in LA, so we usually watch it together. Oh, it's so mean, it's awesome. <laughs> Everybody's trashing everybody Everyone? except their clients. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you have to be really careful. Let's just get it on the table. Who did who? Let's all be nice. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what do you do when you're watching the Oscars? You comment on what everybody's wearing, you know, and it's 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 a great, fun TV moment. Oh, it's amazing. I'm a great commentator. <laughs> and I do have... So you're a hater, too. I am not a hater. Oh. It's not from hate. It's from the desire to not be mediocre and to really have incredible style and to take all these incredibly beautiful pieces and things that people are creating and to really celebrate them and not in a silly way. In the old days when they did celebrate beauty, I mean, when Liz Taylor won an award, Liz was fabulous. And I, I would hope, you know, that we would get back to that day because those were incredible days. <laughs> Hollywood's Pantages Theater, it's the motion picture industry's night of nights. And the film capital's top stars turn out for the annual presentation of the coveted Oscars. Jessica! The right piece on the right celebrity is the best PR. Um, you can't buy that PR. It's uh, a photograph that is seen worldwide. Um, one photograph is picked up by countless blogs, and you are focusing on that jewelry. The dress, yes, but the jewelry really makes that photograph, and the accessories really make that outfit. And at the end of the day, the dress is easily knocked off. The jewelry is priceless, it's invaluable, and people know that jeweler.
because it's kind of like a motto. Jewelry stores don't really have a theme to what they do. Besides Tiffany, no other stores really have like a theme to their jewelry. It's all just like tropical. When you're young, you want to wear a diamond. You're gonna want to wear. When you're old and you get divorced like five times, you don't, you don't need any of that stuff. Well, ultimately we're talking about a jewelry store. How it is this pop culture kind of circular weirdness. Old women everywhere know that song. Do they really? Yeah. You can go ask any woman you pass on the street and they'll, they know that song. You'll say the world has come between us. Our lives have come between us. So I know She said, I think I remember the film I miss. I recall, I think we both kind of liked it. And I said, well, that's the one thing we got. No, Audubon, so when this ends up on the cutting room floor of this film, this will make just let us know, because we've got stories about Carlisle, the Carlisle. Yo! Yeah, I lost my virginity in the Carlisle. No, shut up. With Elaine Stritch. The music video was filmed like right here. Uh, like I actually wrote it on this guitar. And I hate when things are over. So much is left undone. And I said, what about breakfast to Tiffany? She said, I think I remember the film. throw out a pair of earrings. Like, it makes me sick to my stomach. <sighs> they were in tissue, and she like cleaned her room and looked everywhere and said, I think I threw them out. Because she's like paranoid that she's a celebrity and doesn't want to leave a messy room, because then the housekeeping will say she's a slob. And she totally threw them out. Well, there aren't many ways you can get a lot of like well-known names in a film. <laughs> and I said, what about breakfast to Tiffany? She said, I think I remember the